Chapter 22, Hush Puppies. The whole gang waited for Jeep in front of the Eldridge Hotel at 7th and Massachusetts. It was a sticky day, the kind where the sun hides behind weighty clouds. Whew, there's not even a breeze, Sally complained, fanning herself with a tiger beat. Mike asked, do you guys want to go over to the quarry to swim? Too hot to swim. Not without suits. Michael, Dana suggested we could go explore the old Edmund Wilcott Castle. It might be torn down by fall. Oh yeah, Derek said. That's one of my personal favorite things to do. Mess around a condemned building. Machete our way through spider webs. Get busted for trespassing. trespassing. Go for it. Not really. It's a cool place, Dana protested. My dad's head of the committee to save Wilcott Castle. I'm impressed, Mike said. Next idea? The mall? Sally offered. No money, no ride, no way. Derek said, how can summer be so short and so long at the same time? Might as well enjoy it, Sally said. Next year, we'll all have to have jobs. Anne reminded them, I already have a job. I cook for all my brothers and sisters, and that doesn't mean putting hot dogs in the microwave. Lots of chop chopping. Do you get paid? Of course I get paid. I get free room and board. We all do, but you have parents, Anne said. Finally, Jeep's dad let him out in front of the hotel with his two little brothers who were about six and eight. I had to babysit, he grumbled. We're not babies. They can't even zip their own pants, Jeep said. At which point, of course, all the guys chucked their files, their flies. Why is it girls never forget to zip up and guys always do, Dana asked. That's a sexist remark. Derek takes offense, tisk tisk, Dana chuck clucked. We sure haven't seen you around much, Jeep. Hey, you're just my white friends, he said, grinning. Most of the time I hang out with the brothers. That's us, Calvin and Luther cried. Not you, armpits. I mean the guys from church. And besides, I've been over at the KU library a lot. You go to the library during summer vacation, Derek said. Jeez. Calvin, jump on his face, will you? Jeep's brother was only too glad to accommodate, leaping and glooming onto Derek's neck like a chimp. I can't breathe! Jeep peeled the kid off and threw his arm around Calvin's neck as if he were holding him hostage. I've been studying up on things. I might just end up smart, or an FBI man. Let's not stand here like idiots, Mike suggested. Let's go eat. Yeah, because what I've got to tell you needs to be heard when you're stuffing your faces. Jeep glanced up and down the street. How about Long John Silver's? Oh, yeah, he added under his breath. Whoever had money kicked in two or three dollars so they could order a family-sized fish and more, and all six of them crowded into one booth. Naturally, Calvin and Luther were banished to another table, where the first thing they did was loosen lids on all the salt and pepper and sugar shakers in the malt vinegar bottle. When the order came, Jeep waited until Derek's mouth was stuffed. What's that you're eating, ma'am? This, he pulled the whole ball out of his mouth and studied it. You're a pig, Sally said. It's a hush puppy, Derek said, popping it back in his mouth. That's what I thought. Okay, this man up in Iowa, long time ago, he was a church deacon, deacon named Theron Trollbridge. Kelvin, stop tearing open all those straws, unless you're planning to have them all stuffed up your nose. Anyway, this guy, Theron, he used to let runaway slaves stay at his house all the time. See, the poor fools would run off with no particular place to go, just following the drinking gourd. The North Star, Dana translated. And those slave hunters who got money for bringing back the runaways? they get get bloodhounds on the trail, see? Well, sometimes the runaways would just jump in a river to put the dogs off their scent. But up near old Theron's place, there wasn't even a creek. It was as dry as your bathtub, Derek. Get to the point, Derek said, was growing impatient. Besides, he reminded them that the $1.50 movie would be starting in 20 minutes. Okay, okay, anyway, old Theron, Luther, don't you put that life preserver off the wall, or I'm throwing you to the sharks. Theron used to feed those bloodhounds. What a traitor, cried Anne. But wait, he fed them corn dodgers. Sally so said, what are those? Well... They're like, sort of like balls of fried cornmeal, like we're eating, Mike said. Yeah, right. Only Theron spiced them up good with 
Streichenine. In a minute, those dogs were dead meat. And you know what Theron called the corn dodgers? Don't tell me. Let me guess, Dana said. Hush, puppies. Mike gasped and spit a mouthful of soggy mush across the table. Eat hearty, Jeep said merrily. After the movie at Penny Annie's soda shop, Jeep told them about the typhoid, typhoid fever. Typhoid fever. Everybody in town had it in 1856 or 57 because the whole place was like a pigsty, and they drank raw milk hot out of the cow, and as soon as one person picked up the bug, boom, he passed it right along. So I said, like the flu we, got, we all got last winter. I swear, I coughed for two months, except for one little difference. You survived. This typhoid stuff killed people. It's how Ms. Lisbeth Charles died. Jeep said. I'm so sure that I'd lay my brother's lives down for it. Hey, Calvin yelled, but I can't figure out how she got walled into that room. Mike jumped in with, we can develop a bunch of grotesque theories, though, starting with savage Indians. You've seen too many movies, Dana said. Indians are never once mentioned in the journal, and anyway, the Delawares around here are friendly and peaceful. No Indians. Okay, murder. Let's say somebody is dying of the typhoid thing and he wants Miss Lisbeth dead for some reason. So he opens a vein and squirts blood into Lisbeth's eye. Sally sucked in the screechy part of her coke. You know how boring you guys are? That's all you ever talk about anymore. Slaves and dead bodies. And how, now dead dogs. I mean, really. Squirting blood into the poor woman's eye? Sally's right, Mike said. Let's declare a truce. No more talking about the skeletal remains of any unknown parties as found in Dana's house until school starts. Two months, Anne protested. Okay, until the 4th of July, Mike conceded. That would give Dana a few more weeks, enough time to solve the mystery, and besides, she'd promised to give up the diary at the beginning of July. Suddenly, she noticed that everyone was waiting for her to say something. Mike said, we've all agreed except you. You're the keeper of the bones. July 4th, Dana agreed, nodding. They all crisscrossed their straws on the table. 